Hey everyone, this is a dialogue about techniques for having difficult conversations with our friend, the authentic relating teacher, Sarah Ness. So given the world is getting ever more polarized, we talk about the basic skills we need to learn to stop relationships breaking down. The ability to notice yourself when you're in conflict and make decisions about what you want. Like fundamentally just notice what is at stake for me here? What are my concerns? And what do I want here? And then with other people, kind of the ability to do the same thing, to be able to stop in the conversation and to be able to identify what is it that the other person wants. So part of the skill is also like, how do I know whether this conversation is worth having? Um, how do I step away if it's not? And then how do I create the best possible interaction with the other person in the, in the frame of like, how do I be most kind of kind to them and their viewpoint and understand it most? And how do I walk away with some ideally deeper, deeper understanding of not only them, but their point of view. So how do I, one of the goals I want people to get is just like how to learn more about people around you instead of just polarizing against your viewpoints. How do you use this as like an excuse to enhance your life? And how to recognize the language that we're using and how to avoid triggering people's cultural immune systems. How do you speak in someone else's language? How do you speak to what matters to them specifically um, and understand them as, at a deeper level, but also kind of get past some of the cultural antibodies that we get into where, for instance, if I'm a liberal speaking to a conservative, there are certain words and mannerisms and phrases and metaphors that I use that the other person doesn't. How do I listen for the metaphors and the, and like the words that they're using to really align, which you know then doesn't hit some of those antigens that we so often do in conversation. So we're putting on a course with Sarah, The Art of Difficult Conversations, starting in about three weeks time. So check out the show notes below for details and hope you enjoy this conversation. Sarah, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to see you again, David. Yeah, it's good to see you. So we're going to talk about The Art of Difficult Conversations, which is a course that you're going to be teaching for us. I know you've thought very carefully about this. And also, we're going to sort of tie it in a little bit to the cultural conversation. You've got the different layers of it. You've got the interpersonal and how that shows up in our own lives, how conversations break down, how certain topics are difficult to talk about, how it can take other people's perspectives and appreciate kind of the different levels of disagreement and the different levels of communication. And there's also how that then plays out in the culture war dynamic and how a lot of these, like re really central to what we're doing and what you're doing as well is the sense that we need to develop these new capacities, particularly with COVID. I think people have really felt like so many of these topics have become really divisive and have kind of really um, led it to, to being an almost essential set of a skill set that we need to develop to kind of navigate what's going on at the moment. Yeah, I don't think there are many tools that are more relevant and ubiquitous than the ability to talk to other people. How do you think the pandemic has affected the, the, the wider conversation and the wider need for these kind of skills? A couple of things. Um, there's always divisions between different people, but I think prior to the pandemic, it was a little bit easier to keep our echo chambers, right? It's like by all by all accounts, the world has become more polarized over the last decade or so. There's a lot of research that shows that we're more likely to identify with a set of ideologies instead of just a single belief. So like I am Republican and all the things that go into Republicanism instead of just like, I believe that abortion is bad. Um, so we've polarized more into these spheres. I think as a large response already to the uncertainty into the in the world, to environmental issues, to you know wars and conflicts, to uh, America losing some of its supremacy on the world stage, to just you know the rise of technology, not knowing what the world ho holds. And when people are confronted with uncertainty, they want to hold on to what they know. Um, so that's one of the factors. There's tons of reasons I think that we've become more polarized. And the pandemic not only increased the uncertainty that people were feeling, because we're like, what the fuck? Like, I don't know what's gonna happen one month from now. Um, it also 
And it took away a lot of our belief in the God of science, because for the first time, people weren't able to say, okay, you know, science has told me that this vaccine is a good thing. Instead, the, the news was changing all the time. And for many people, I think science was the last God they had. So it's like our faith got taken away, our certainty got taken away. And then the polarization started cutting between people instead of just between social groups. So it's like, um, some of my friends believe I live in Texas. And so it's actually, my friends are like, there's, there's a, there's a lot of people that believe that they don't want to get the vaccine or that the vaccine is a bad thing. Um, or that they don't want to mask. And I'm partially between the, the hippie communities and like the rationalist and sense-making communities. So there's a lot of difference in viewpoints. And previously, I think we could avoid a lot of that difference. Um, it's like, you know, maybe I had different beliefs than my family. Maybe I'm Democrat and they're Republican, but with my friends, I chose my social group and generally we believe the same things. And then that all of a sudden wasn't true, even between friends. And so we were forced to confront a lot of the issues of disagreement and power um, and uncertainty that we just hadn't really had to in our daily lives before. Although I think on a micro stage, we do this every day. We have to negotiate with our boss for a raise or with our colleagues to treat us differently or with our family to you know, uh, be willing to hear our views. So, but we didn't usually have to do that as an identification. And what do you think are the skills that we need to develop? What are the kind of tools, skills, perspectives that we need to learn? The core frame of it is this, there's this saying, um, it's actually a, comes from a Buddhist sutra or from Socrates or from like some talk show host in the, in the 1980s, it's not entirely sure. Um, but it's this idea of the three gates that conversation should pass through. Is it true? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Um, and taking that frame, a lot of the time when we're talking about sense-making, I think oftentimes we're debating about what is true. Uh, like what is objective truth? How do we get alignment on that? How do we talk with other people about it? But a lot of the time, that's not where people are, are, are actually motivated from. And so then comes in the question of what is necessary? Like, what is my actual goal in this conversation? What is the frame that we both think is true? Um, and then how do I get to that? And then what is kind to me underlies all of it. Like it's almost a filtering mechanism. What I say and what I do, is it gonna have a positive effect on me, on the other person, on the world, or a negative one? And those three things can often be in contrast as well. So there's a lot of um, training our minds to be able to consider different things in the moment. And so in the course, we'll look at things from the level of the internal, like how do you deescalate yourself enough during a conversation to be able to think at all? Because when we're triggered, we can't think, we can't consider. Um, and then how do I get, go subject object, like look at my own perspective to go, what is my goal here? What do I want? What am I, what am I thinking? What am I considering? Can I get that in the amount of time I have with this person? Cause the answer might be no. Um, and then what do I do if that's the case? How do I set a boundary or step away or move to a different topic where we can talk about personal instead of intellectual, whatever it is that you want. And then there's the relational, which is between us. Like, how do I figure out what it is that you want in this moment? Your concerns, your motivations, ask like why or what matters to you about this? Um, or what are you wanting here? Uh, how do I share those things myself? Because in order to ask the other person to share their vulnerability, oftentimes I have to reveal mine first. It's like, and it's, a, it's an act of trust. In my trainings, I say uh, people only go as deep as each other goes, right? Or people only go as deep as the, as the leader goes. Um, so there's vulnerability. And then we go to kind of the level of, of concern of like, well, what am I valuing in this moment? What matters to me? Um, and you can address people more at either of those levels than the level of content, which is what are we talking about? And so we'll, we'll play a lot with like, how do you interplay these ideas? What is true? What is necessary? What is kind? Content, context, concern. Um, and then just like generally, how do you relate to each other overall, like in a way that is both caring and will get your, 
your goals met in the conversation and hopefully the other person's too. And what are your sort of main influences in the work? I'm thinking in particular about things like integral theory and the idea that looking for sort of as many perspectives as it's possible to take on the on different topics, the understanding that everyone has. Jonathan Haidt is another one, I think, who really looks at the, the book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Religion and Politics, to look at like we have these different core values that lead us to see the world in different ways. So what would you say that you're mostly drawing on in terms of your kind of frameworks? Integral theory for sure. And the idea that there's, uh, there are truths that are more, like all truths are equally valid, but there are some that are more valuable than others. And then there's the question of what are they valuable for? And we often have different contexts or frames on what that is, like what we're each looking for. So integral theory is like mix of um, understanding the different balances of things and the different levels at which people are thinking, uh, but not necessarily, um, well, integral doesn't always do this, but the way I hold it is like, there are many valuable truths and there are many valid truths. And so uh, being able to frame them has been really helpful for me in understanding that. Um, also some of just psych psychological ideas, the idea of psychological safety, um, that we can't actually have a good conversation unless we're feeling to some extent safe with each other. And that there are lots of ways that we establish that, like in our gestures, in our facial expression, in nodding, in reflecting, in asking questions. Um, these are all signs that we want to get to know the other person. It kind of has our nervous system relax. And there's these ideas of like, polyvagal theory and nervous system activation and zone of tolerance that go along with that. Um, and also I wanna say a thing there, um, oftentimes we think of that as de-escalation only, like, okay, if I'm in conflict with you, I have to get quieter, I have to be reasonable, I have to be with you right now, right? That can be perceived as a power move by the other person. If one person is upset and angry and they're like, I want to get my view across and the other person is going, well, let's calm down here, right? It's actually, it's actually kind of a status move. So some of what we'll play with is how do you meet, some, how and when do you meet someone at the level of intensity that they have or in the meme or language that they're speaking? Um, and so that idea of memes as well has been influential for me of like, what is the full belief system that someone is in and then how do, I, how do I speak in that? How do I use the same metaphors they do? How do I use some of the same words? How do I get curious about parts of it that I don't understand? How do I reflect their argument in a way that they can agree with it? Uh, and even imagine things that they haven't fully said in it. Like, oh, I imagine something important to you here is having your friends and family safe. Is that true? Like, what does that look like to you? Um, so there's this kind of digging deeper that nonviolent communication also goes a lot into, which is an influence of mine of like, what do I see? What is underneath it? Um, what needs do I have in this situation? Which in this case, I'm, I'm kind of collapsing into the idea of, of concerns or values, motivations. Uh, so those are some of them. And of course, authentic relating and circling, which are my stock in trade. Yeah. And how would you describe the the influence of something like authentic relating like how does that show up a couple of things one i also forgot to mention internal family systems is something that i use a lot the idea that when i'm defining authenticity in authentic relating there's not just one truth there's multiple at any given time there's multiple parts of me that are speaking we think that we're negotiating with people outside of us have you ever gotten a song stuck in your head? How well does it work to negotiate with your brain? Like we're already doing this inside of ourselves at all times. We say we don't negotiate with terrorists. Well, I've definitely tried to <laughs> tried to negotiate with my brain to like get a fucking song out of it, right? So we have all these contrasting parts. We have these different authenticities. And part of what authentic relating is, is, is like looking and digging deeper. Like what, what are the different sides of me speaking what are the different motivations they have? What are the frames they hold to be true? How do I be more honest about that in relationship with the other person? And if I'm not doing that, why is it? So it's this, it's this act of self-reflection and getting faster and better at doing that continuously 
And it's also this act of understanding the other person and being able to do that more quickly and more effectively. Like there are some questions that I ask that will make the other person shut down versus questions that will help them open up. Like, tell me why you hold that view is very different than, can you tell me why you hold that view? So there's like intonation, there's understanding our effect on other people. And then I think in both authentic relating and circling, there's this idea of kind of the, the we space between us, which is where is the space that we can come together and have a common conversation, both on kind of a, a direct and an energetic level um, of like, you know, if, am, I, am I speaking at the same level as you? I was, when I was talking about escalation a bit ago, am I speaking in the same language in the same world? Are we kind of on the same wavelength? And how do you create that uh, alignment and engagement is a lot of what I've learned from authentic relating. And at the simplest level, it just starts from skill and tool training. Authentic relating games are exercises that kind of squish the world down to a certain set of rules that we can practice. And I mean, I already kind of made the link earlier on, but I'd be interested in how you would make the link between the individual skills that we're developing and the broader kind of cultural situation or the, the bigger conversation. <laughs> so something that I've been doing lately is instigating debates on Facebook mostly to see how people will respond um, and how individuals respond to uh, larger arguments, like potentially polarizing things. Um, and something I notice is it's like people have an allergic reaction to views that are different than their own. Like in the moment, it does feel like a life or death. And I think there's a couple of reasons. One, our system just like doesn't know the difference. It, it doesn't really have a lot of levels of, of calibration when it comes to trigger. It's basically like, I am upset or I'm not upset. Like I can be various degrees of upset, but when that switch gets turned on, there's not, there's not always a lot of gradation. So one thing is like that in the moment reaction is going to be intense. And two is like that our reactions have a lot to do with our feeling of belonging with our social group, which is you know where a lot mm -hmm. of the difficulty with polarization comes from. Because if I don't believe the same things, I could be kicked out or legitimately kicked out, like as we're seeing in things like the Me Too movement um, of the group that I am part of. So it's like this instant kind of inflammatory reaction, which is the same thing that happens when an individual gives a view that I don't like. So like when we're talking about cultural memes, what we're really talking about is a collection of individuals holding perspectives and debating that at a level of, of like what is true, I think is something that, that you are brilliant at and that rebel wisdom is brilliant at, at like at, uh, presenting different points of view. And I don't think that works for people that really aren't open to different perspectives. So I don't know if I have a lot of skills for um, combating cultural memes at the level of memes, because memes are like, they're, they're like corporations, right? Like if you take, if you think of a corporation, like an individual, um, a corporation is made up of all the people in it, but the corporation itself is going to be really hard to sway. Like you can't convince a corporation to do or not do something. You can convince the people in the corporation to do or not do something. And the higher level of status of the person in the organization, the more likely it is to trickle down. So if we convince, if we can relate with more powerful people in better ways and more empathetic ways, we have a higher chance of changing the meme. But really, I don't know a better way to do that than to talk with the individual people. And I think each of those conversations really does have an effect. Like it takes a long time to change a relationship, to change somebody's mind, to even change myself, right? Like how should I expect that one conversation is gonna change someone else or is gonna change a meme when I have to work for years to change something in my own psychology? So I think a lot of what I wanna do is teach people the skills to just have each of their interactions be a little more aligned to the goals that they have in the world. Um, and ideally towards kindness, towards themselves, others, and culture as a whole. And those little effects add up over time. Like with my dad, I gave the example earlier of like how when I was growing up, he he was a narcissist. Like he didn't really see other people's views. And he, he said he says himself that like he didn't understand that other views could even have validity. Um, 
And over a long period of time of like talking with him, of vulnerably sharing my point of view, of getting curious about his, of setting the, the frame for me of like, hey, dad, like I want to convince you that I have a perspective here. Like I remember having a three hour conversation with him once where I was like, this is my frame. Are you bought into us trying to do that? Like, are you open to me trying to convince you? Um, and him saying, yes, our relationship has really drastically changed. It's like, I can't convince him of all the things I think are true, but we're able to have conversations about it now. We're able to each share our views. Um, and, to, and I imagine that that ripples out to the way that he's navigating and negotiating with the rest of the world, including the idea of someone that, that someone who has lower status and power, as I think he was seeing me as his daughter, um, can have an effect and that their view can be equally valid and valuable. So I want to teach people to create more of these reference moments, more of these little um, abilities to affect themselves and others that over time really can change a culture. And what can people expect if they do the course? So um, one of the things that we might play with is this idea that I've been um, working with for the last year and a half, which is came from the idea of like, um, authentic relators and circlers and conscious communicators in general um, have this idea that our way of communicating is right. Uh, we're like, man, if everybody talked like this, the world would be such a better place, which admittedly is kind of what I'm trying to convince you of here too. But there's a specific language that we use, which is like, I have to be curious and we ha I have to offer insight. And the fact is that that's not how everyone communicates. It's what I call a receptive form of communication. It's, I'm waiting for the other person to ask me questions. I'm assuming that there's gonna be a back and forth in this, that's gonna be a slightly slower pace. Um, and that's actually like an ideological belief, right? Um, it's, it's somewhat intolerant to other ways of doing things. And so as I've studied the ways in which people actually communicate, I have this theory that there are four primary ways that people communicate. They tend to ask questions, they observe the situation, and then sometimes say like what they what their observations are, or often even if they're speaking, like tracking what the conversational dynamics are. Um, those are the more receptive types. The more expressive types is they tell stories. They teach, they relate about their experience. They tend to talk at length or until they're interrupted. I hate to admit this, but I'm oftentimes a storyteller. I judge them, but I like talking. I like explaining. And then there's the challengers. And they like the back and forth. They like bantering. They expect the other person is going to respond. They push until they do. So when you get people that really like debate, they're not always looking for you to back down. A lot of the time what they're actually wanting is contact. They want you to come back at them. People that are storytellers, they might be willing to share really vulnerable examples. Like, you know, your grandpa that always seems like he's challenging you. Well, what happens if you ask him like, hey, grandpa, can you tell me like, a story about your childhood or where some of these beliefs come from, you might find. And it, one thing about this is we tend to go to certain languages when we feel safe and certain languages when we feel stressed. So if you're finding someone in a specific language, like they're asking a lot of intrusive questions or they've just stopped talking or they're challenging you a bunch, there's a question of, are they in their safety language or their stress language? And if they're in their stress language, like how can you meet them to encourage more of the safety in them? And how do you notice what language they switch into when they feel more comfortable? Um, even if like, you know, you're with your grandpa then and you're just around the table, like, what is he doing? Well, if I notice that he's telling stories, then when he's getting all challenging, I might be like, hey, I want to slow down. I'd love to like know where these beliefs come from. Like, can you tell me a story about, you know, your time in the war or whatever? And I imagine that influenced you, right? Um, and knowing that for myself as well, like, what do I go to when I feel stressed? What do I go to when I feel safe? And in the moment, like, what is my range of tools? You know, I can, I can tell a story. I can share something vulnerable or give facts. I can like debate and like meet this other person with intensity or make a joke or like go for a back and forth. I can ask them questions um, and discover more of what their reality is, or I can sit back and I can observe some and look into like, what, what is happening here? What are my responses to it? What are, what are any insights I have? What am I noticing? So this is a bit of more of a toolkit that can help meet people where they're at. So I just wanna name how 
how difficult and uncomfortable the work is of trying to see other people's points of views. Because we have to leave the space that we've found and consider home and, and go elsewhere. And also, even in that home, to belong, we have to take on a lot of beliefs that we don't fully hold and then espouse them as if they're our own. And that I think also causes some internal tension where we hold them more strongly when we get out of that area because we're not totally sure if we believe them in ourselves. One of the main practical tools we're gonna to be playing with in class that has to do with uh, the frame of what is true, what is necessary, what is kind for this conversation is a silly little mnemonic that is stop, top, soul, and goal. And except for stop, these can kind of be done in any order and they can be iterated in any order. And they're both for what I do with myself and what I do with the other person. So the first thing is stop, which is either stop myself, like pause and go, wait a second, what is going on in me here? Why am I upset? Why am I triggered? Because until I get the space, I'm not going to be able to see it. I am the trigger. Like I am the, 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 like, I don't like what you're saying right now. That's all of me until I go, wait a second, why am I upset? So that's, so I'll give you an example of like a way that this has looked in a, a conflict that I've been having recently. Um, so I have a coworker and she and I were in, uh, she was in a class that I was teaching. Her name is, well, I need to change her name. Um, I'm gonna give her the name of another student I worked with recently, Latasia. Um, she's an African-American woman. And uh, she, we got in this conflict where there was a student in the class that was proving kind of difficult for me to work with. And Latasia uh, started kind of being very vehement about me having a conversation with this woman. Like she was like, you need to clear this up. You need to like be able to talk with her. You need to share impact. Um, and we got in this whole conflict about it where I was like, I wanna, you know, like, I was like pushing back. I was like, I have already had these conversations with her and it didn't work. Like, why are you pushing me so hard on this? And at some point I was like, wow, this is not working. We're literally just shouting at each other on Slack. And it's starting to look really bad to the rest of the team as well. And I'm worried that our relationship will fracture. And so I had to do this process of first, I was just like, hey, can we, can we pause this for a second? Like, are you open to just like having a conversation with me about this? And I had to do it myself too. I was like, luckily this was happening somewhat asynchronously. Like it was exchanging WhatsApps, it was exchanging Slack messages. So I was able to say, wow, I'm getting really upset. Let me stop, let me go for a walk. Let me think through what's happening here. Um, and so I was like, okay, what are we doing specifically? Um, she's saying that she wants me to be more transparent with this student. First of all, am I even aware that's what she's saying? So I was like, do I even know what she's asking for? So I had to clarify that. Like, do, is that what you want? Like, do you want me to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her? Would that allay your concern? So that's like on the top level of just getting clear on what the fuck is going on. Um, and then I'm trying to convince her of my point of view. So then the soul level, why, why does she care? Like, why does she care whether or not I talk to this student? And why do I care about defending myself? Well, I care about defending myself because I feel like I'm being piled on to from all sides for this course that I feel like I've done a good job with. And now there's this one person being like, you fucked up, you fucked up, you fucked up. And my identity is at stake, like my identity of feeling like I'm a good teacher. And so I'm getting super protective. Okay, cool. Now I can look at that. I can go subject object on it could be like, is what she's saying actually an indication that I'm not a good teacher? How would I know if I'm a good teacher or not? What does a good teacher do? Wow, a good teacher kind of listens to other people's point of view. Am I doing that right now? No, I guess I'm kind of being a bad teacher, right? But for a different reason than I thought. And then I started asking her too, like, why, why do you care so much about this? And it turned out that there was all of this stuff behind it, that there was these beliefs that in white culture, we're uncomfortable with conflict and we don't bring it to people um, even when things are really important. And there was all of this behind it, like Latasia feeling like she couldn't show up with me in the company um, because, because of our racial difference, but because of the specific way that was playing out where she felt like I wasn't really gonna be direct and honest with her. And so she couldn't bring her intensity to me. It was like, oh my God, wow. This is like not only something I totally didn't know, but it's potentially transformative for our relationship. 
And so then I asked myself, what is my goal in this conversation? This was actually one of the first things I did. Do I want her to see me as a teacher? Do I want her to get my point of view? Do I want to get her point of view? I was like, actually, my goal here is I want to have a good relationship with my, with my coworker. And I want to be able to develop my understanding of, of race relations so that when things like this come up again, I have a better understanding of what's going on. And so that's basically what I asked her. I was like, what is it that I could do in this situation that that's going to have the best impact on our relationship? Like, I don't really care about this student at this point. Like, I don't know if I can resolve that conflict, but what can I do to earn your trust? And then also like, let's have a conversation about what can we do in relationship so that you feel like you have more space to share really openly with me. Cause that's something going on on the soul level. And it worked, it worked really well, by the way, like we have a thing now where we can send WhatsApps and we're like, send a message of the next thing is going to be unfiltered. And then we just go off and we know that the other person is willing to hear it. Cause we've had that negotiation with each other. We've been like, okay, what are the kind of rules of engagement for our relationship? Um, and it's really, it's really changed our relationship a lot, but that wouldn't have happened if we stayed in the conversation we were having, which is, I want you to share with this student and me going, I don't know why you're coming down so hard on me. Fuck off. Sarah. So the course starts on the 5th of April mm -hmm. and we'll be on Tuesdays for six weeks. So if you have enjoyed this call, uh, please check out the show notes below. You'll find the, the sign up details. And Sarah, always a pleasure. And see yeah. you soon. Yeah, it was great talking. Thank you for the interview. And hope to see you all in class. <laughs>